And welcome to Light Talk. This is Stan, and I'm broadcasting from my state-of-the-art studio in the swamps of Gainesville, Florida. Hi, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. And this is David in Long Beach, California, and we are the Lumen Brothers. So guys, you believe that? This is episode 48. No way, Jose. (laughs) It's too long. What are we doing? Okay, so do you know what episode 48 means? It's the opposite of episode 84. (laughs) <laughs> which we'll probably hit next year sometime. Anyway, but what it means that we are quickly approaching some very important milestones. They, they come in different areas. Obviously, the, our Facebook group page is, has exploded. We, it's the Facebook page is a, is a big airplane right now, 777. No, oh, that's right. We're 777 as we speak. Yeah, we're triple sevens. Wow, well, which means we're really close to 800, which yeah. means that we're closing in on 1,000. Wait, let, uh, me double, so, let me double check that. <laughs> Okay, well, (laughs) it'll change because this is going to come out in a few days. So (laughs) there'll be a lot more than that. But anyway, we have the Facebook members. We have total downloads, which is really insane. The number of downloads. How many? How much? How Uh, much? uh, We're very close to the big 3-0. Not 30. That means 30,000. And also, we have pretty much conquered South Africa. We have. Yes, it's pretty amazing. Actually, most of the continent of Africa. Uh, I, I, which is really surprising. Uh, my wife and I have a little uh, competition to see who gets Africa first uh, <laughs> because her, her podcast is going after Africa. But yeah, I mean, I think that's really cool. We've got, you know, we've had Greenland for a while. And anyway, um, and also 48, 48 is close to 52. And you know what 52 means? It's the opposite of 25. Yeah, yes, but what does 52, if we do this on a weekly basis, what does 52 mean? That's, that's the number of weeks in the year. That's right. We are going to have our one year anniversary coming up. Is there a cake so coming? Is there a cake? We are still planning this out. And oh. we have we have staff. By the way, we, we've had a the staff problem. Did, that we we're hire, did we hire somebody? No, we have a problem with Light Talk Central staff. I mean, they're coming and they're going. And uh, turnover. It's, we're churning. We're churning. It's just, it's just like the Trump administration. Right. You know? <laughs> I think we're getting people. We're getting a lot of people from Washington. Let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So they're working on it. But 50 52 means we're going to come. We're approaching our one-year anniversary. I really right? don't believe this has lasted this long. Well, maybe it's all a dream. Coming up, we have a very special announcement. We cannot tell you what it is right now, but it is going to happen, and uh, we're very, very excited about it. You can't even tell me, right? I can't. Yeah, I can't tell anyone. So you know, so why are you? So why are you saying it? Uh, it's a tease. It's something we, called a tease. So oh, it te- keeps people it's listening. Teaser. Right. Okay. And, like, you know, like, like okay. nothing better to do with their life but listen to us, you know, really. I mean, come on. <laughs> so anyway, we have that very special announcement coming up. We have our listener questions coming up here. And, and I have the first listener question. Uh, Ian Garrett from Toronto, Ontario asks, hey, guys, would you be able to talk about the Prague Quadrennial? Well, the Prague Quadrennial is pretty amazing. Uh, what is it? What is it? I've not been well, there, so every tell me four what it years is. In Pro- well, first of all, have you ever been to Prague? No, I hear it's great. Okay, Prague is one of the most beautiful cities in Europe, and, uh, and, it's, and it's worth just going there. But what the Prague Quadrennial is, is a meeting of all these amazing artists, and it happens every four years. It started way back in 1967. And it's the world's largest event in the field of sonography. 
And there's a competitive area of this where people bring their contemporary work into the quadrennial and it's stenography work. So it's anything that really has to do with theater design. You can see all different disciplines there of design and you'll see it from all over the world. So it is really a place to go to just view of what's happening in the world in scenic design or scenography. So I think that's a really important thing. Now, I went years ago, and unfortunately, it's, it, it's held usually during a time when I'm very busy, so I haven't been able to go back. But a lot of our students go, and I know USITT has something going on with them, and they always had. So I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I have visited other quadrennials uh, in, the, in the world. I, I know there's one in, um, well, actually, it's a Biennale. Uh, in oh, banana, Venice, yeah. in Venice, yeah. and that was just amazing. I've seen a few of those. Uh, but yeah, I would highly recommend it. So the question is, is it worth it really? I mean, is this something you should do? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you will get to see really what's on the cutting edge of, of design. And, and usually uh, USITT or some other uh, uh, organizations will, will publish a lot of the exhibits uh, so you can actually, if you can't be there, you can, you can actually see it. But hey, I can't think of a better tax write-off when it comes to research to, you know, get a, get, get a plane ticket and go. Because you're going to be in probably what a lot of people consider the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, and you get to see those, uh, that amazing work. What do you think, Steve? So Ian, let me, uh, um, I have been. And uh, my school uh, does participate in uh, the, pod, uh, the Prague Quadrennial. Um, let me put this in perspective. Uh, you, you, we just closed the Winter Olympics, right? So you saw that. Think of the Prague Quadrennial as the Olympics for uh, art, <laughs> for right. performance. Uh, the last time this was done uh, was uh, back in 2015. So I can give you some information about that. Uh, in the 2015 Prague Quadrennial, uh, the event lasted um, 11 days. Uh, there's, there were 60 indoor and outdoor performance spaces all over Prague. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, when I looked at the numbers on this, uh, what the Prague Quadrennial says is that designers from 78 countries were present with their work. Uh, it had 180,000 uh, viewers who wow. came to see this. So it takes over the city of Prague. Uh, there were 1,300 students from all over the world who were taking part in workshops and performance and presenting their work. So it's a massive thing, which I suspect is why they can only do it every four years. David's right. Uh, you can go to the USITT website, and they have all kinds of information about the Prague Quadrennial. I, I kind of suspect you've already looked there and seen that. But uh, also the Prague Quadrennial has a website up that, that really goes into fairly uh, detail about how you might participate. If you do want to participate, I think the cutoff for submitting your application for the 2019 quadrennial, which will be the 15th, is uh, May 1st. Oh, by the way, that is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's the 14th, the 14th Prog quadrennial. And that is going to be uh, taking place uh, June 6th through June 16th um, in 2019. Okay, our next question comes from Katie in New York. I have just left graduate school, and I'm assuming you graduated, and in New York City. At what point in your career did you stop taking electrician gigs and just concentrate on design? I need the income, but it seems a little dicey to keep doing both. Well, yeah. you know, you're at an interesting point in your life. You've, you've just left grad school. Um, you're moving into a major market and you're wanting to know how to make a living. Um, I think realistically, when you get off the bus and you walk into New York, you're going to have to do some electrician gigs. You're going to have to do some assistant gigs. You're going to try to design. There's a lot of stuff going on there, so it's not like you've been doing this for a long time. But I would suggest that you want to kind of phase out being a stagehand as fast as you can. And the reason being is it's going to impact your work because people are going to start thinking of you as that go-to person who can design, hang, focus, run, and strike the show. And if you do that for too long, when they have simply, I need a designer, 
they won't think of you. They'll take your name off the list because they already have an electrician to do it. So it's, it's a difficult dance you have to play. But I would phase out being a stagehand as quickly as you can and just simply concentrate on being a designer. I think, I think Steve nailed it. Exactly right. Um, as fast as you can. Uh, or as long as you have to, you know, I was lucky. I was able to go home at night and had a place to live, you know, so I could sort of turn down stuff and start hunting for design work. And um, it's it's a hard one. Well, what's going to happen is when a good design comes along, they, they just won't think of you. Right. They'll, you, they'll think, you, get, you get typecast. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is always really tricky. You know, I mean, um, I was told by uh, a very famous designer back when I was an assistant he told me, never take an electrician job. Now, I think that's a little too yeah. severe, but he was really serious about this. And uh, he said, you will be immediately branded as a technician and not as an artist. Now, I that was his words. I don't know if I agree with that, only because I know a lot of you know, great uh, electricians who are also artists, <laughs> okay? Right, right. And, and that happens. I guess you could just have to look at it. Now, one thing I was thinking about what Steve was saying about going to New York, I, I think you need to avoid something because th- there's, there's this view of New York as being the only place to make it, right? And we've talked about this on the show. I guess my, my advice is don't be Joe Buck in Midnight Cowboy on that bus going into, into Manhattan, and for those who have not seen Midnight Cowboy, it's about this, uh, this guy from Texas, a young man from Texas who thinks he's going to make a living in New York. Uh, and uh, he has all these, you know, glorious dreams and he gets off and he steps off into reality. And it's basically a story about reality hitting this guy right in the face. So I think that you need to do what you can do to survive. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend going Joe Buck's way or Ratso Rizzo's way, but I do think it's important to try to stay in the entertainment field. And I think this is why a lot of us in our schools also teach architectural lighting. We teach the skills that you will need to get jobs, you know, like AutoCAD and Revit and, uh, you know, and programming and things like that. I think you're much better off getting work as a programmer than as like a, uh, a technician, an electrician on, on stage. I think you're right. I was going to say, and Steve had brought this up on a prior show, that the programmer is sort of, somebody asked a question about, you know, I forget how, what, what the question was exactly, uh, but Steve made the point that now it's, you know, having that programmer, having that second person helping you make the art is really powerful, and that's a really great thing to do. I would certainly lean towards that rather than swinging a wrench and hanging a light if you want to be at this. You're working closely with the designer. Yeah, and if you do decide to take the programming route, buy your own console, and I'll tell you why. Mm. Why, a David? Lot of... <laughs> and, now Steve is being me. He's jumping in. <laughs> why, David? I'll tell you why. Because a lot of your first jobs, the, you're going to be working for companies that don't have a lot of money, and uh, they are going to rather hire a programmer who br- can bring their own console with them than to actually pay a lot of money to rent a console. Now, you can also roll that that rental fee into your fee, but I think that will give you a heads up. And consoles now are inexpensive enough for you to buy your own. Plus, you'll learn it a lot better. It's a good point. I have a, a former student who did exactly that and um, uh, yeah, would provide his design services and the console, and then they would pay him. That would be part of the package. And um, Increased his, increased his yeah. revenue quite a bit. Well, well, most professional programmers own their own consoles, and they own multiple consoles as backup. And because they actually make a lot of money renting their consoles, you know, to the uh, you know as part of their fee, uh, so you could do it on a much smaller scale with a less expensive console. But even you know small consoles that you can buy for you know s- several thousand dollars, you could pretty much handle almost any rig. It may not be as versatile as an EOS or, or, or a, a Grand MA, but you can still get away with, with a lot, the 90% of what you want to do, you know, with maybe a used ion or something like that. Right. So yeah, I think that, that'd be a, you know, a great way of, do, of going. JC in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania asks, do you think large-scale lighting and media production is getting out of hand in worship facilities? Mm. Well, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question, but I'll just say... Like generally, I, I don't I don't go to church. 
let me take a historical perspective on this question. So, so once but upon a time, we get, get right? tell us about the Bible and, and, no, and yeah, about well, like Adam a little, and Eve? no, like a little, yes, like a little theater it's history, a biblical thing, okay. a little theater history. So, you know, when the when the church was trying to spread the gospel in Europe, right? This is what I remember my theater history. Part, <laughs> the idea was that most people were illiterate and they couldn't read the Bible, so these spectacles were made right to to basically these allegories to tell the stories and so the spect- and, and the spectacles got so spectacular this has happened before that eventually the the church became concerned that the spectacle was becoming more of the attraction than the than the gospel and so the the that all got thrown out of the church right and all of a sudden it wasn't there and now it's back again so now the church is using spectacle to you know share the, the gospel so I think it probably does get out of hand. If, if, let's put it this way. If, if the spectacle is overshadowing the message of what the, whatever institution it is, then you're sort of losing it. Even in a play, you know, if the spectacle is, gets in the way of the story, of the humanity of the story that's being told, then that's, that, that's over the top too. So is it or isn't it? I don't know. But I think if you're asking the question, it probably is for you. Mm, I, I do have something to say about this since I write for a worship uh, design magazine. I knew you would. I knew you would. I'm anxious to hear your perspective. <laughs> Which I actually, I, I guess I can plug the magazine. It's Church Production Magazine. I've written for them for many, many years, and actually I'm on their technical advisory board. So I have to put all that out right, 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 right front. Uh, but I've also consulted on a lot of houses of worship. And, uh, you know, Stan, thank you for telling that great story because you are absolutely correct. I totally agree with you when you said that it's the same in theater. If the spectacle is overshadowing the message and not supporting the message, then there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Now, to answer the question directly, uh, with the amount of technology that's happening, and I have seen some amazing houses of worship with huge amounts of technology, both in lighting and sound and uh, and uh, video, uh, you know, they have their own control rooms, uh, the editing. It's just unbelievable. Uh, so, and, and everything I have seen, I must tell you, uh, I find it actually rather tasteful. Uh, I believe that people, and again, this is a blanket statement, and again, I'm generalizing, but I believe that people who design for worship, uh, worship activities are very sensitive to the, to the message. And, you know, yeah, we all want to, wow, you know, and, you know they all want to have, the, you know, the better lighting system than, you know, the church down the street. But when it comes down to the actual presentation, I find most of the, uh, of the worship uh, design I have seen actually very, very uh, supportive of the word. So, um, yeah, uh, I, can it get out of hand? Absolutely. Does it? I, I haven't, not, not in my experience very often. Well, you are listening to Light Talk with Steve, Stan, and David, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by... Hey, a year ago, we introduced to our listeners the Juice Hose, Juice Hose (laughs) Jr., and the Never Trip Breaker. Well, today, the Tonry Electric Company of West Virginia now give us the Cytospell Focus Tool. Its name says it all, Cytospell, the preferred focus tool of stagehands throughout Dixie. I own three, one for school, (laughs) one for home, and one for the car. The Cytospell Focus Tool's main feature is a bottle opener because you never know when you're going to need one. The (laughs) Cinespell Focus Tool will open craft, domestic, and all those uppity European beers with ease. Not only that, but it also works with classic pull-tab brews such as Natural Ice Light, Michelob Ultra, and Milwaukee's Best. Why? Because you're a stagehand, my friend, and you can't afford good stuff. (laughs) The Cinespell's Focus Tool is unique in that its fixed position jaws fit all the nuts and bolts on every major lighting fixture, foreign and domestic. Just not very well. But it keeps the manufacturing costs low. So after an hour of slow, frustrating work, you're going to be ready for an icy brew. Did I mention it's also a bottle opener? The Cytospell Focus Tool. Perfect for summer stock, rodeos, and state fairs. So when all those Yankee stagehands can't open that bottle of Shiner, just say, well, bless your heart and lend a hand. 
The Citispell Focus Tool is not compatible with Asian beers, but who cares? Citispell. I, I got to say something here because I lived in Texas for many years and wasn't Steve, wasn't it true? And I, I'm sure it's not the case now, but many years ago, I believe it was legal to drink a beer and drive. Hmm. I really do. I, I, when I was in, Maybe in your school, mind, it was. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I sort of remember this in the seventies, you Could know, be. like you're not going to take the right of me drinking a good beer on the day. And I think as long as your alcohol level is low, you know, you could drink a beer, and it's probably the same now. Well, I think it. Dep- I think I think it depends on the day. <laughs> I mean, if it's 110 degrees out there, who's who is going to wrong, who's going to find you in the wrong? No one. for having a nice cold beer. Now, if it's a winter day, you're oh, cruising boy. down the road. You know, the cop may say, "I don't know about that," but <laughs> but clearly, clearly, you need a sit a spell, folks, tool. Absolutely, I love it. <laughs> Got to get one. And now. Back to light talk. So we have a we have a subject today uh, for your consideration that we're just going to uh, discuss a little bit because uh, since we all teach as well, um, should we be designing at our schools? Um, is the question that sort of the qu- that was burning this morning, and uh, I'll just say yes and no. And I think there's two sides to this coin. One, we never really we we got into teaching because we're there for the students and to give them opportunity and to mentor them and help them grow. And we certainly don't want to take away those opportunities from them. On the other hand, it's good to model the professional behavior and, and let them see how you work and work closely with you and for you to be in that role. I, at my, you know, sometimes I, I really, if it depends on the school you're at too. If you're at a small school and your opportunities, which I've done as well as being at a big school, and the opportunities for you to go out and do a lot of work get limited, then maybe your only opportunity to, to design and or showcase your talent is at your school. On the other hand, if you're at a big university uh, and you require to do research and creative activity, the work you do on campus doesn't really have the same weight as the work you do off campus. So, And I try to take students with me. Uh, in fact, if I do a... a, a a production off campus, I'm almost exclusively will take a student with me and they can see me working in that context because there's a different set of expectations when I'm working as a professional than when I'm working in school. I'm really still wearing the teacher hat and a role model. And when I'm out there, it's like, you know, there's no time for learning. It's a professional environment. So I think, I think it depends on where you are, what you're doing, and what the circumstances are. What do you guys think? Well, um, for many, 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 many years, I have always believed that teachers should not be um, designing at school, okay? And I just was feeling, just the places where I was working, you know, we had enough grad students. Uh, I still have enough grad mm-hmm. students that they could, you know, we that those, these are opportunities for them. And, you know, there are enough to cover all the shows. Uh, you know, my students usually design program and uh, usually assist at least one show a semester. We do enough shows that they can do that. Uh, And I have enough students that they could do that. Uh, I don't believe the schools are a place for my creative work. On the other hand, is exactly what Stan said. I think it's important for students to see their, uh, their mentors work. You know, to see them work in a in a situation where uh, they they are applying professional techniques. Now that goes into the other consideration of, you know, is a school trying to recreate the profession, or as far as productions are concerned, or are they safe laboratories for students to try things and to fail, uh, and to fail safely? Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's a discussion that the school that the department needs to have about you know how. Um, how to treat the productions as laboratory uh, uh, experiences. Now, <laughs> I will never forget a story, and it happened at a school I was working at, where um, I had a student lighting designer on a show, and it was it was completely uh, student designed, and we had a sophomore stage manager calling the show, and on opening night, I'll never forget this. The, the stage manager made a few errors, okay? She may have, she, she forgot to call one cue and, you know, things got a little rough. But, you know, that happens, right? The next day, the chair of the department called me in and, and asked me why these mistakes were being made. Why this student, this 19-year-old student who's taking, you know, stage management class, you know, missed these cues. 
And I asked the chair, what, what are your expectations for these students when they're working in laboratory environments? And the chair said, right. well, I expect them to be at professional quality. I'll never forget it, that, 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 that they have to be at this <laughs> local regional theater. I'm not, saying, I'm not being detailed because then you'll know what school I'm talking about. And I got really upset. And I said, you know, on opening night last night, you had two actors who skipped a whole bunch of text. <laughs> you know, they skipped a bunch of lines. Do you have those same expectations for the actors? Silence. So I think, you know, right. as a department, uh, we all have to be on the same page about exactly why these productions are happening, what type, you know, what expectations we all have for, the, for these uh, quality for the productions. I really want to expand this question to something larger. And um, so all these productions at school, whether they're, uh, we're dance and theater, ha- are going to have a lead director or a choreographer, and they are faculty. And the bigger question is, and this, and I think this trickles down to David's point about is it a laboratory or is it a professional situation? If the if the faculty member who is directing or choreographing the, the the work, if that work is viewed as their professional creative activity, uh. okay, then they are going to self-identify with that product as like a, like a, a traditional academic who is publishing a book or writing a peer-reviewed paper. That is a problem. Because that then is all a problem. Of, okay, Big then, problem. Right, because then all of a sudden, the work that the students are providing as part of their education is wrapped up in the professional quality of what that academic director or choreographer is doing. And, that, and then it's not about the students learning. It's about their show. That's right. Which then, which then they present in their dossier for promotion and tenure or whatever as their work. So, of course, they want the highest quality. Now, that's not to say that we don't want our students to produce the best quality work they're capable of, but in an educational environment. And I often like to say, when we reflect on the work of a student, it's not how good was it. It's how much did you learn through Mm -hmm. the process and grow. So, and, and again, I, I'll go back to my point, but it depends on where it is. So if you're at a, a research university that has the resources to give you time to send you off campus to let you go and work somewhere else, that's where you ought to be getting that credit, not teaching the students on the stage how to act or, how, or helping the designers design. But I think it's, it's, it's sort of a, a beast in the sense that people like us can go away for a week or two maybe and go design a production where the faculty in, in who are directing or choreographing can't really go away for four weeks or five weeks for a rehearsal period. So it's hard. So I think it's, it's really a, a rock and a hard place problem, but the student gets caught in that. And so we do argue that it's about the students learning, but at the same time, the faculty, when they are, their identity is wrapped up in that work, unless you're bringing in a professional director, it's a tough one. Yeah. I think that that is really the key. I've had faculty members actually say that to me, you know, in in other situations, not where I'm at right now, because our RTP documents completely remove any any work at school as as part of their RISCA, which is research and scholarly creative activities. Uh, And but but I've had, uh, you know, in the past they've said, hey. You know, your lighting designer screwing up my show, and that, and, and my show, and this, and it's always my show, right? You always hear it's correct. My it's, show. That's the lang- that's know? the language that's used, it, and it's that's drives you crazy. It's all right. of, it's, it's the- everybody's show, you know. It's ridiculous, right. you know. It's, but but anyway, right. and 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 that's why we removed it. That was one of the main reasons why we removed it from the tenure documents. Well, and you know, one one way to dance around it is to say, well, the creative work that you do on campus has less weight than the creative work that you do. It's still creative campus. work. Well, it's right. It's but still, that student or that, that that question about safe to fail or students to learn or the expectations that doesn't that doesn't take that away. It doesn't take that problem away. The, the problem that you have you know raised with this for your consideration question. So uh, and also, I also found when I've had here when I've had been asked to when I design at school, it's sort of like I'm designing in the cracks. You know, I'm designing between meetings, I'm designing between classes, I'm designing between all kinds of other things. When I go away and I'm a guest artist, all I'm there to do is design, and I love that. So I think I, think I, get, I, think I get better work when I'm not doing it on campus. But if I can take the student with me, then it's terrific. Well, I think the cautionary tale here is, uh, again, buyer beware. I think if you're a student 
and um, you have to do a little research. I think if you attend a university, uh, be it small or be it large, and you want to be a theatrical designer, and the season is designed by the faculty there, you, you need to leave that school. Right. You, you need to say, okay, I learned some stuff, but this is not where I'm going to stay. If you're applying for graduate school and the bulk of the season is designed by faculty, you, you need to go someplace else. You need to go where you can uh, develop your skill sets, where there's faculty uh, willing to mentor you, but also where, where there is a community and it starts, I guess, with the dean or the department chair that this is a, uh, a laboratory situation and you are allowed to be a student. And with that, you're allowed to succeed and you're, you're allowed to uh, fail. I, you know, I think uh, the pros of having a faculty member design a show is certainly we do learn by imitation. We can see the process mm-hmm. they go through. I think clearly the con on that is that it's taking away uh, opportunities for students. You know, the question is, uh, how do we want to put groups of people together to produce art? So, you know, it comes down to that question, who is directing? And, you know, you know, at my school, we do seven theater shows a year. Uh, four are directed by faculty. Three are directed by student. And if we can... They are 100% designed by students. The only time the faculty becomes involved in designing a show here is if there is an emergency, if, uh, if a student had to leave the program or we cut a student from the program. But we are actively trying to have our students design everything here. If for no other reason they're working with people their age, particularly on the shows that are directed by students, you're working with a peer group, and that group is going to make a journey together, and perhaps that journey continues once you graduate. It's very different if you're a student working for a faculty to director. No matter what they say, there is that relationship of faculty and student, and you're never going to be part of that peer group. So that's, that's a different dynamic, but it's still an important dynamic that you're working with someone that you have to treat slightly differently. And frankly, if you when you leave and you go into the profession and you're, you're working with a friend of yours, that's one relationship. If you're working with some super hot director who can pick anyone in the world, that relationship is going to be different, too. You're not going to be on an equal footing with that person. So I encourage um, universities to let students design. And that comes with good, good news and bad news. But that's what a university is in the business of doing is training people. Uh, to do do this profession. I mean, we see it on the PhD level all the time. On the PhD level, those departments who are offering doctorates are more than happy to let PhD students teach a class. And that comes with good and bad, too. You can have an outstanding uh, PhD student in there offering a great curriculum. And you can have another PhD student who is quite terrible at what they're doing. But the mission there is to help them learn how to be an educator on many levels. So the same way they try to mentor those Ph.D. students, then we have an obligation on the MFA level to put our students in the same situation or similar situation and mentor them. There's only so many things you can learn by reading a book. You, you do, have to, you do have to be engaged at some point. Our last question is from Todd in Chicago. I am struggling a bit. When I look at my work, a lot of it seems cliche. What might I be doing wrong? What is cliche? I am going to take it that Todd is talking about cliche in the sense of it seems old, it seems used, it seems you know that we've seen this before or he's seen it before in his own art. You know, <laughs> I can relate to this in the sense that sometimes... You know, you start using the same angles and there are some angles that I love using and there's some fixtures right, I put right. there where I always put. And then right. I write a cue and of course that light is throwing a shadow up on that stage left wall and I've done that, you know, a hundred times before. And maybe it's cliche because maybe a better angle or a more daring angle would be much more interesting, but I know this works. Uh, right. Maybe that's safe. I don't know if it's cliche, whatever. Anyway, what, what you might be doing wrong 
is not opening yourself as an artist and just expanding your art and trying different things. Now, it's a little different when you're a student and you do have that ability to refocus lights and to you know try things and fail and you don't have to worry about being at a four hour crew call uh, you know to get a hundred cues written uh, you know so so maybe you sometimes you do things that you know are going to work but if you're in a much more flexible situation with less pressure absolutely try a different color try something new and think out of the box I mean look at the play as a new type of movement that you're going to create, a new type of piece of music, and, and use a different instrument. You know, instead of using an oboe, you know, use a piano there, uh, just for the hell of it. Uh, that I have found, you know, in my own work, that that is how I break out of that sort of cliche type of or old type of uh, uh, design process. Well, I looked up cliche to get the precise definition. And, and according to the internet, it says... Uh, Cliché, uh, a phrase or opinion that is overused and, betray, and betrays a lack of original thought. So I think, you know, if you're doing this a long time or any art, you know, there's stuff that works, like David said, is only, you know, maybe there's only so many angles that one can put a light, but there's a lot of places you can put a light um, in a box or whatever shape your theater is. And I think right. and your drone, you got drone focus deluxe too. Yeah, you, you got drone focus deluxe now, right? <laughs> so the focuses can be dynamic. I guess, I guess you know, uh, David's point is right. It's like you do have to push yourself, and maybe one way is to see other people's work um, and see what they're doing. Wow, I never thought of that, right? Or to just kick stuff that you do all the time to the curb and and start fresh and just it, it's sort of like this thing we talked about episodes ago about to be an artist, you sort of have to be fearless. Right. Be willing to try something or do something you haven't done before. And I think that's one way to break out of it. Well, I think uh, when you look at cliche, cliche is is the color blue if it's sad on stage. <laughs> cliche is red if it's angry. Cliche is pink if it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you escape cliche? Uh, I think it's through thoughtful research, you know, meaningful design conversations um, and honest, hard work about thinking through the production. You know, it sounds to me like you're phoning it in. You've got one light mm -hmm. plot, and you simply mm. change the title block on it. And if you're doing that, you're just being lazy, or, or, or you're not, or you're not doing your job as a designer. You know, design is hard work. Designers are problem solvers. That that's what we do. David's right. You have to push yourself to explore new colors, new ideas about gobos, new equipment. You know, are you creating a world for the play, or are you just putting some light on the stage? You know, I, you know, it's it's. I'm not quite as bitter as uh, are you designing a show or systems, but it sounds like you found something that's comfortable. It works. You put it in all of your shows, and and there you go. And you're wondering, you know, maybe why you're not moving up the food chain as a designer. It's it's because you're not taking any risks. That's a good point. Take that's my point about fearlessness. Take risk. Try it. And don't be afraid to throw it out. I mean, sometimes I'll throw that moving light down left and down right on the deck to get that up, that diagonal up light, and I don't use it because it's wrong mm -hmm. for the show. It's hard because I don't know you and I don't know your work. But I would say try to be invisible. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. you can go and see an incredible rock and roll show and the lighting designer's work is invisible. You can go to a ballet or a theater or opera or go to a movie and that work is invisible. And you sit in that world, whether it's rock and roll or cinema or theater, and you're totally immersed into the environment of the show. And yeah, you're having a great sensory experience, but you don't leave the theater talking about a strobe, or you don't talk, you don't leave the theater talking about a, you know, a, a kangaroo gobo, or, or you don't, you know, cliche, that's Hamlet uh, in his graveyard speech, and everything goes blue, and there's a white, you know, downlight on him. I mean, that's cliche. How, how do you make it different? Bring in a mirror ball. How do you, <laughs> you know, it's, well, maybe, but, you know, cliche is also the expected. Yep. And I think one of the things I tell my students, uh, and, you know, you put this in your cookbook, uh, is your first idea is almost always the wrong idea. Right. Your first idea is almost always the cliche idea. And I argue one clean, simple idea for the show. 
What is that one clean, simple idea? And keep going back to that idea and let the action drive that idea and your idea support the action. So that that's how you're not cliche. That's a great answer. Hey guys, that Hammond organ solo in the background tells us that once again, you've spent a precious 40 minutes of your life listening to Light Talk. Look for the next episode of Light Talk here on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, Spotify, or the Light Talk Facebook group page. And while you are there, post your comments and questions and be sure to subscribe to Light Talk. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. In other words, what Steve is saying is, please, don't burn down your theater. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Lone Star State. (laughs) And don't forget, keep those questions coming. You can email us at David, Stan, or Steve at lighttalk.org. And be sure to tune in next week when we feature an interview with our good friend from Malaysian professional, Eric Loder. All that and a new sponsor. Light Talk is coming to you every Saturday. Every Saturday. (laughs) We will see you all next week. (laughs) Same time, same channel. Bye-bye. From Light Talk. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.